Good afternoon or good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Uh, la, la, da, da. We are live and hopefully we didn't mess this up. We uh, had some technical issues this morning setting up and had two streams offered up <laughs> until just a minute ago. Hmm. All right. Oh, Matty. Yeah, I got Matt in the house with me today, guys. Um, cheers to everybody that's uh, joining us. Um, let's get the pop-out chat. There we go. Nice and big. Matt, what am I looking at, man? That's the chat. Really? That's not helping out at all. Nothing to see. We popped out. Wow. Loving that. All right. Well, guys, I know you're here. I can see that you're here. Can you somebody uh, send us a chat message? We're having problems seeing our chat for some reason. I'm not sure why. Right, Matt? It's not just me? Well, I don't think we have comments yet. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. There we go. It's working. Fantastic. Oh. Well, how's everybody been? Because I tell you, um, I'm confused already. All right. <laughs> and there's Matt Wright joining as a member to the membership program. Cheers, Matt. Um, today's live chat is all dedicated for question and answer. Well, I got to be careful not to do that again. That's loud, ain't eh? We're going to do question and answers for you guys. Uh, feel free to pick my brain. Uh, the questions in the chat is for members only. If you're not a member and you want to watch the live show, that's great. Uh, feel free. If you got questions, perhaps you can jump in with a super chat. We, uh, it's, just, it's just too busy if I open it up to the whole community, right? It's impossible to manage. We're going to do a couple of hours today, so make sure everybody's got a chance to get in there. If you're joining us right now and you've got things to do, come back later. Don't worry about it. All right? Um, I think we're the only channel in the world that's dedicated to helping homeowners renovate their houses and be successful and does Q&As. I know. Like, that's amazing. Hey, Benjamin. Cheers, buddy. Um, okay. Well, listen, I don't have a whole lot to the other. I didn't put together a presentation today. I figured we'd just jump in, get into questions. You know, like I'm all up to date in the forum, which is awesome. And if you're not familiar with that, we do have a membership forum designed so that you guys can send us pictures and then I can help to diagnose situations and make recommendations based on your house, where you live and the age of your home and what the goal is that you're trying to accomplish, right? There's a lot to consider there and budgeting and everything else. There's more than one way to do anything in this world. So we are trying our best. Okay. Oh, you know, I'm wondering... Hey, hey, Corey. Benjamin Davis, will you ever release a video on skim coating a wall for a level five? <laughs> yeah, why the heck not? That sounds like a good idea, actually. We could do that. Um, oh, here we go. We got an interesting question. It's a super chat. How do I quote painting jobs? That is almost impossible to answer. There's so many different ways to do it. Um, right now, I would suggest that you quote painting jobs based on what the market will bear because there's a labor shortage. So whatever you quoted last week, unless you're, unless you're not, unless you're, unless you're turning away almost 80% of your business from being out of the market, you're too cheap. That's how you quote, right? So figure out your formula, do a bunch of quotes. And if you close too many of those jobs, it's because you're too cheap. And that's the only way that you can compete with the market right now. So there is no formula and it can adjust. Next year, you can have a different pricing structure than right now. But don't be afraid to charge. Um, <laughs> you'll have in the luck today, Melanie. I just got back from golfing with my boys. So this is me doing a live show after a really lousy front nine. Ugh, it's horrible. I suck so bad. It's not even funny. But I'm trying to learn some new skills. My boys are both uh, spectacular and I suck. So that's fine. I can't beat them at everything. Um, yeah, but that's it. If you want to, if you're in business today, guys, um, make sure that you're 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 closing a really small percentage of, of of things that you're quoting on. Okay, 
and and don't put too much into it. Yeah, it was. I don't know where you're living, Mel, but up here we uh, we had what, 29, 30 degrees, something like that. And what's that in American? Like 90s? Yeah, low 90s. And it was not humid, and there was like just a little breeze. And the golf course had lots of mature trees, so that was fun. There we go. Hmm. Oh, Melanie's not a also. So yeah, you appreciate what I'm saying. All right, there you go. Well, cheers to everybody in Ottawa if you're watching. There we are. Oh. Oh man, I'm feeling really stiff actually. I'm seizing up. All that exercise. There we go. All right. Well, I don't know about you guys, but uh, we have actually got a really cool video series starting tonight. Uh, we're doing a six o'clock release today because we wanted to get the live show in first. And we are starting a series where we're um, doing the conversion work of the church. Hey, cheers, David from Hawaii. Aloha. Here's the deal. We, uh, we got the church property. We made plans for a massive renovation. We thought we'd be there for three years doing a huge undertaking. And then the whole COVID thing really put a kibosh on the plans. We got stalled out. We couldn't get materials. We couldn't get um, architects. We couldn't get anything. Like, it was just nuts. So we put it on hold, and we did studio videos last year. This year, we started doing um, – uh, we decided we were going to just sell the church. So in order to sell it, we want to get occupancy permit because we've done the, the work to change it from institutional to residential. And so now we are starting that series tonight. We're taking the kitchen that was there and repurposing. We're rebuilding, right? We're going to turn it into something really awesome. And it's a, a few week series. And then we've got to uh, make the two piece bathroom there, a three piece out of shower. We're going to add a laundry room. So we got a lot of really cool videos about all of that kind of stuff. And that is all coming up in the next little while. So make sure you check that out tonight at six o'clock. All right. And give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. I think it's going to be a really good series. It's designed more on the, um, I don't want to say cheap, but it's economically beneficial. <laughs> Basically, the concept is um, with inflation going the way it is, we thought we would tackle a few projects that were on the uh, cost conscious side of things, right? Uh, for all those folks who are looking to get things done and don't want to lose the time, but are, are feeling the pinch. Um uh, okay, so we got a guy named Mo here from the greater Toronto area. Wants to turn part of his concrete front porch to an insulated mudroom. What should I put down for the floor? Um, a heating system is what you should put down. I would put a heating system in tile because you can tile that like it's an exterior tile job. Mo, and then with the right kind of concrete and, and the, um, the right additive for exterior tile work and four season climate, if you put that over a tile heating system, then you're going to have a heated front entrance that's going to withstand all the temperature changes and climate changes, and you aren't going to have issues with condensation and that sort of thing down the road because electric heat keeps everything dry, okay? And so that's what I would recommend. Um, throw in a couple hundred dollars with a heating system out there, and it will absolutely blow your mind how effective that is in not only just heating up the space, but keeping everything dry and not running into condensation issues. Uh, Danilo has got a question. Should I remove interlock before starting a deck? Well, that's a difficult question. I guess it all depends on whether or not you're going to install a floating deck. If you're going to float a deck and you want to just set it on the interlock and you're in a four season climate, then the deck will lift and then settle again altogether. If you're not in a four season climate, then it shouldn't be an issue. But the thing with decks, if you're going to ask a question, guys, you got to tell me where you live right? I don't know if you're in Alaska or Alabama. I can't tell by the question. And there's such a different answer for geography. So just try to keep in mind when you're asking questions, tell me where you live and that'll help. But um, there, there's different building codes for different regions because of different storm systems. So if you live in tornado or hurricane regions, you your deck can't float. It's got to be, uh, you know, in, in attached to wood structurally and then in the ground. So that's a thought. Um, well, got a question here. Have you ever done a video on French drains? If not, how do I go about making one? The rain is killing my foundation. Huh. Um, 
Yeah, no, we haven't done the French drain video yet. We will be uh, at the end of the year. We've actually picked up another property that we're going to be doing some video series on. Um, I haven't told anybody about this yet, but there's a few things in the way before I can make that announcement. Uh, one of them is a work visa in the United States. So we'll see how that all works out. French drains are really simple. Basically, what you do is you dig a trench and then you line it with a, um, uh, oh my God, I hope my brain works today. Geotextile, okay? <laughs> and basically what that does is it, it keeps the water from going through the, geo, the, the geotextile and diverts it. And so in that trench, you put in a three inch um, a perforated tube with a sock on it, and then you put clear stone on top. So all the water that goes in that area, you slope the ground to the, the French drain about a foot from the house, right? So all of that water that lands near the, the foundation gets diverted to wherever that tube ends up going. And that is a simple system. You don't have to dig very deep. In most cases, if you put a six inch trench in the ground, you can divert all the water away from your house if you need to. All right. All right. Um, wow, we got another super chat here. Cheers from Newfoundland, by the way. Have you guys ever been out this way? No, we haven't. We haven't been anywhere yet. Well, at the same time we finished the farmhouse and uh, the channel started growing and we started to want to travel, we were told we weren't allowed to go and visit you guys by the Canadian government. So <laughs> we've been stuck, stuck in limbo. And finally, the restrictions are opening up. So we're making plans to do some traveling. I just, uh, it's too early for me to start sharing. I can't, and I don't want to upset anybody, but um, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I have never been out to the East Coast. I actually had a holiday book to go to the East Coast for a couple of weeks with my wife. And this would have been for the spring of 2020, and it got canceled. So that kind of was a damper. Um, Joshua wants to know, what's the most effective way uh, to cool an attached garage during the summer in Toledo, Ohio, if there is one? Yeah, I would suggest maybe a mini split. Or honestly, if you don't have insulation in your garage, get some. Because a lot of the heat that you get is radiant from the sun, right? And so if you can um, put like a foil-faced insulation on inside your garage to deflect all of that, that'll make a huge difference. But adding a mini split is definitely the biggest solution if you want to turn that into like a, a year-round workshop. All right. Cheers, Josh. Okay. Danilo is in the GTA. Okay. Current pavers are sinking already in some areas. Deck is going to be a floating deck, roughly 20 by 14. How many footers should I have? Uh, okay. <laughs> 20 by 14. You're going to want at least six, right? Because you can go 14 foot wide if you use two by 10 box beam. But you want to do that, you know, every, every, eight to 10 feet. So if you do three sets, you can get away with six, but you're going to be using all two by 10 wood. You can't use two by eight on long spans. It's just too much deflection, but you can get away with doing six posts if you do two by 10. All right. And that might seem like it's a lot more expensive, um, but at least it'll last. Remember deflection is a big enemy. Whenever you get deflection in your deck, the fasteners that you use are moving around and it, and it, makes it really dramatic when you get sitting water and, and ice and snow. And then, you know, it advances the rotting system. So definitely go with two by 10 on that and you'll be fine. Cheers, Josh. Robert's in the house. Hey, buddy. Uh, you booked a ticket on my tour in the spring of 2020. Springfield, Massachusetts which was the closest location. Okay. Got canceled. Looking forward to next time. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, there, here you go. There's a question. Like, I want to get you guys engaged in the, in the questions today. Uh, I know we're in a live chat, and, and there's going to be a lot of you guys that are watching this after this is done. We had a tour where I was going around and doing a speaking tour and, and you know, doing um, real in-person uh, training sessions for a lot of different stuff. Is that kind of thing interest you folks out there? Let me know in the comment section in the video below. All right. And tell me what kind of things you would be interested in sitting down and learning about um, specifically. Like, you know, get as crazy as you want. Do you want to learn about how to start your own little small business? Or do you want to learn um, how to turn yourself into a real estate buyer and flipper? 
or all that kind of stuff. So feel free. Um, hey, cheers to Scott Green. He just joined our membership program. Right on. And Angel is saying yes. Good. But like, be specific. I want to know what kind of information you're looking for. Okay. There's a lot of different options out there. I mean, uh, I could do a training session and teach you about tile for two days. Um, you know, we could we could spend an entire day just talking about waterproofing bathrooms. Wouldn't be hard. So, I mean, there's a lot of different things to do. I think last time I was on tour, I did three or four sessions. Hey, Matt, I can't remember. I think it was three. I talked about um, the value of your house, renovations, and what you get back. I talked about how to get a contractor. I talked about a bunch of that kind of peripheral stuff, right? Corey wants me to come to Minneapolis. I know. I got a lot of people from Minneapolis wanting us to come up there, and I'm looking forward to visiting. Um, Sherry says, I'm here in Ottawa, and I would love some in-person training. Hmm. Right? Maybe that's a, a good start, Sherry. That's not a bad idea. Maybe we, we book a hotel um, venue and we do like a, an Ottawa location where it's a little bit easier to organize first. <laughs> oh, Josh, please. Listen, I, I, I do not claim to be the, um, the best at everything. Okay. Um, oh, my God. That's ridiculous. Here's the deal. I just... I believe that I can make a living sharing my experience and helping you guys avoid a lot of the pitfalls I've had to go through over the years uh, and helping homeowners to get a really good quality renovation. Because the bottom line is you can't afford a contractor. That's just the way it is, right? They're getting harder and harder to find. They're getting more and more expensive and they're getting, um, how should I say, uh, less and less and less experience on the crew. Like a lot of the experience that they used to have is retired. So it's pretty scary. Melanie's in. Look, we got two tickets sold to Ottawa already, Matt. What do you think? <laughs> Maybe what we should do is we should set out up here in Ottawa and we'll um, put some drywall up and we'll do some hands-on drywall training. Because that's like the most artistically inclined thing that people need to learn how to do. Talk to me, Sherry, Melanie, what do you think? Drywall training, is that, does that sound fun? Because like we could do a little school and everybody could take time on the tools and, and get used to it. I could show you like all the tricks. Hmm. Yeah, she wants to finish her laundry room. Yeah, no kidding. You know, what's funny is uh, I remember growing up, every time we bought a new house, my, my parents would be like, one of the first things that got done was a laundry room. Because my mom spent so much time there. <laughs> so this is what she would do we'd, we'd have to make the laundry room perfect first oh, okay yeah cheers david i appreciate that we we try we try to make these videos not just so that um they're entertaining but you can actually learn skills right there's lots of stuff on the internet that's entertaining where you can spend 20 minutes learning one trick but i'd rather try to film my stuff so that you get the feeling that you're standing right next to me and i'm teaching you on site and hopefully that that comes across Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay, so Sherry's in. <laughs> right? Oh, here we go. Uh, Richard, welcome to Money in the Bank. Appreciate you joining the membership program, buddy. Um, make sure for all of the new members, you guys go on the homepage of our YouTube channel. And underneath there, there's a community tab. And welcome, Sean, to the membership program. Under the community tab, if you click that, you're going to get information there on how to access the forum. We also have an email there for troubleshooting if you get confused or have issues. Okay, so uh, my wife, Michelle, takes care of making sure that everybody gets in there and is able to operate that properly. It's not that complicated, but we did design it ourselves. And so, you know, it may not be the most user-friendly experience in the world, but it's definitely efficient. Okay, yeah, there we go. See, that? that's, that's, that's Michelle right there commenting on my behalf. <laughs> oh, urgent. We got a super chat here. I have cheap Paramount board with studs throughout my home. Should I tear down these walls and put in stud walls? I can't actually encourage anybody to tear out walls over the internet on a live TV show. Um, wow. And I'm assuming that Paramount you mean like paneling? Maybe that's a brand name. I'm not familiar with that word. 
But if you've got paneling with stud without studs throughout the house, without studs. Yeah, I guess that all depends on 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 where you live. My goodness. I know that um, there's lots of manufactured homes out there that have got different building technology and the electrical boxes actually are, are attached to the paneling and not framing, which absolutely blows my mind. I don't know if there's a whole lot of value for putting in stud walls, except the fact that it, it wear and tears better. But uh, my biggest thing would be for best return on your investment, I would just paint it. Uh, if you have paneling, I would just paint it with the um, odorless kills, zinzer, sorry, not kills, odorless zinzer. And that's a great transition primer to go from anything like that material. And then you can paint all your walls and you'll end up with a, you know, much more modern look and return on investment on that. That'll, that'll blow your mind. So don't consider the idea of tearing all that out to go to drywall. I would just go to paint work and rely on that quality paint job to be the solution. Uh, so yeah, so Angel's saying he'd, he'd rather learn about building relationships with non-big box vendors, right? Well, you know what? Here we go. That's a great conversation. Um, I was uh, shopping the other day and I couldn't find a big box. So I went to a small box and then their inventory was lousy. They couldn't find solve any of my problems. So I ended up going to a home hardware out in the country. And this store was absolutely amazing. All right, shout out to the home hardware just outside of Winchester. You guys are awesome. Um, family owned, and they knew what the heck was going on. They asked me questions that I forgot to ask. Like, they made sure that I didn't leave the store without everything that I needed. And it was an amazing service. Home hardware in Canada, all right? Down in the States, you got places like Menards and Ace. I know Ace Hardware is, um, I think they're co-op stores. So, like, you're going to get that personal service. And I think at the end of the day, if you're at a place where there's there are co-op and you're going to get that owner in the store experience, that's where you want to go. Because at least they're going to take time to make sure that you had a good experience and got answers to your questions, even if they've got to do research for you. All right. You aren't going to get that at the big box stores in most cases. There's no personalized experience. They just know what aisle products are in. And that's about the that's about the best the training is. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, Sean here. I'm in the middle of a whole floor reno in Hamilton, Ontario. I had spray foam done, and now I regret not running some electrical for wall sconces. <laughs> Any tips for adding electrical to spray foam walls? <sighs> boy, oh boy, oh boy. Yeah. Um, there are some really cool craft guns out there. There's like a heated coil on the end of the gun. And you can actually just trough out the spray foam and run your wire that way. I don't think I've got a link for anything like that. Sean, send me that question in the forum and I will research and find a link for you, buddy. All right. And I'll uh, be able to send hook you up with a tool that you can use. And you should just melt the foam right out of the way. All right. Um, it's, it's not that complex of a structure. You can't do that. All right. Isabel said, I passed my electrical inspection thanks to you. Hey, good job. I'm putting up the wall board in that area, and it's my nemesis. I've watched your videos and want to fix it, but at what point is it just not worth it? Okay, Isabel. Here's the thing. Um, when you're doing drywall, less is more. Okay? Um, and that will help a lot. If you sand, if you find that you put too much mud on the wall and you sand it back, and you don't want to revisit that same problem, you can prime drywall after the second coat, right? Wait till it dries the next day and then put on your next coat of mud because then you are going to be able to have the, the ability when you're sanding to not sand through the paint, okay? And it'll help to make sure that everything, you, you'll, you'll sand back to what you filled in, all right? Um, Matt, can you go up a little bit? Because I missed something there. Yeah. C. Reese, welcome to the membership program, my friend. There you go. Um, Scott says he's installing luxury vinyl plank first time. Slab, two-story home cake. Five mil, 12 mil wear layer with pad. Albuquerque dry climate, 26 year old baby barrier. I'll just grab it. Uh, no, you don't need to have vapor barrier for LVP over slab. Um, yeah, especially like in New Mexico. You're going to be just fine, Scott. No worries. David Souza, quick question. What would you recommend I insulate the outside of my CMU wall with to keep the heat from radiating through? 
Hmm. Insulate the outside. Um, when in doubt, rigid foam works really good. Okay. And then, yeah, Melly loves home hardware. Yay. Bradley's in the live show for the first time. And then we got Paul. Paul. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> Look at you. All right. That's cool. Paul's working out the, me the, the, the method here for communication. He's got props and stuff going on there. That's fun. Oh, all right. Um, yeah. All right. Cheers, guys. Ah, uh, la, 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 la. Okay. We got a question on your help. How do I fix my peel and stick vinyl that I put on top of linoleum floors? Some water spilt and got underneath. I even tried to double secure by using Loctite paste. It's all mushy now. Yeah. I don't know what to say. I think you might have stumped me. Um, I think the, the reason that you're stumping me is because I don't ever look at peel and stick like a long-term solution. It's a really temporary solution. And the problem with linoleum floors is it it really is waterproof. And so the water has nowhere to go but sitting there. And you're basically dealing with a water-based adhesive. So it's just going to go to goo. Yeah, I think you're kind of stuck. Wow. Yeah, there is no solution to it. I would lift it all up and start over again. Remember, most linoleum floors are installed on top of quarter-inch plywood that's just stapled down. And it lifts off with just... Like a pocket knife and a 10 year old can do it so don't be afraid to pull all that up uh, it's an easy removal just got to get rid of all the little trims around the outside of the rooms and it pop it out in no time bradley gibbs doing the mobile home renovation and just found out that the t11 siding on it is particle board with no vapor barrier should i rip that off and put up a zip board and put new siding on no 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 there's no you're in a mobile home right um, the T1, T11 siding, there's nothing wrong with that. And you don't really want a vapor barrier on the outside of the house. You want an air barrier, which is what that zip board would be. You're going to have to convince me that it's worth spending the money on the zip board because I don't see it. Resist the temptation to fall in love with new building technology on older homes or homes that don't have a return on the investment. OK, it's just not necessary. Like if you're going to put zip board on your house, you better buy $14 a square foot tile for your flooring. Right. Like you've, that's that's the upgrade you're doing. That's the equivalent. And if you're not going to spend $14 a square foot on flooring, don't go spend that kind of money on zip wall and brand new siding because you're not going to get any return on investment. And I don't know if you're going to get that much of a benefit out of it anyway. Um, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. If you want air sealing and you really want to take the siding off first, then you just go with regular Tyvek and tape it up nice and tight. And you'll have a great air barrier. Oh, uh, fire blocking when framing a basement. Yeah, it's only part of our building code up here in commercial situations or if you've got making it a separate unit. And fire blocking is usually at four feet. All right, halfway up. Hey, Chris. Cheers, buddy. Um, or should I just put house wrap over the old siding and put new siding on? Yeah, weight is a thing. I get it. Well, if you really want to put new siding on, you know, and then get rid of the weight, take the old one off, and then put the house wrap and then put new siding on, that's a great renovation, right? Then at least that way you're going to get um, you're going to get a finish that you don't have to paint every few years. So that's an upgrade, and that would make sense. So cheers, David. He just joined the membership program. And again, guys, if you're watching and we haven't mentioned this, the chat's only available to members or Super Chat, okay? Just so that we can help answer questions. So if you have burning questions and you need to clear the cobwebs of the internet world, by all means, um, give us a holler and let us know what's going on in your world and we'll see if we can help you. Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, Reese Contractor cut the solid aluminum ground connection from the breaker box to the plumbing. Worst, leave it or splice between with copper tubing from torn out plumbing supply. Well, first of all, if you have an aluminum ground from a breaker box, you're 
wiring is old. I would suggest that you install a brand new ground with a copper wire. Really what it is, is the, it's just a, a, a like a plate, like a big rectangle plate. Okay. And it's got a stem on it and the wire goes and ties onto it. And what they do is they just kind of shove a, a, a shovel in the ground and make a little trench and then they hammer it down. Okay. And they run the wire to it and that's grounded. All right. And they bring that wire into the panel. And that is the source of the grounding for the whole home. So don't be splicing. Don't do weird things. And if the contractor did it, make the contractor fix it. All right. Piece of cake. You don't go touch your wiring when your contractor made a mistake um, because now you don't have a liability issue. You got no protection. So the minute you touch something uh, like that, that's supposed to be done by a trade in your own home that a contractor made a mistake on, you're letting him get away with bloody murder. So don't do that. Jordan says, thanks for all the help, Jeff. Any tips for fitting blocking between old twisted studs? Yeah. Yeah, I do have a tip. Okay, ready? So you have a wall, let's call it eight feet long. Measure the entire width of the wall. Count up how many studs there are, all right? And then take that number times one and a half. That's how many inches you remove from the total length of your wall. And then you divide that number by the number of stud bays that you have because they should have all been installed 16 inch on center or whatever, right? And then you cut all the blocks the same size. And then you start wedging them in from the middle, working to the way outside. And they'll all start to square off just by doing that, okay? And that'll square off the stud. So don't worry too much about it. And if it runs you in any, any too tight of a difficulty, you can always take an eighth of an inch off or a quarter inch off somewhere once in a while if you need to. But that's what I would do. All right. Uh, 18. Working on sister and Joyce for bathroom tile. Sister and Joyce for bathroom tile in an 1820 house. Yeah, no kidding, eh? That is going to be work. Okay. Um, Yowzers. David needs to do some stucco repair. Some of it's faded. Which paint and how should I apply it? Uh, with heavy texture, you're going to want to use like a 31 millimeter roller or an air sprayer would be ideal, right? Depending on how much of a project you're going to get into. Um, setting up a spray machine can sometimes take a lot. You can get a gravity fed, um, high volume, low pressure sprayer uh, from Husky at the local building store and hook it up to your air compressor and that'll do small areas. Okay. Um, and, and that's worth it. The, the bathroom series that we got coming out, guys, I actually sprayed my own kitchen cabinets with that Husky sprayer and it worked okay. Like it, it takes a while. It doesn't have a wide spray. It's a little slow. The compressor is always charging, but it is a much better system than, than the battery, you know, just plug and play battery ones that you would use. And it's uh, you know, 50 bucks. So it's a nice addition to the, uh, the compressor tool. And Carol has joined our membership program. Hi, Carol. If you got questions, get them in the comments section, darling. And Chanel, I'm guessing that's what that is. I almost called it channel, but that would be wrong. Welcome to Money in the Bank. All right. Uh, Chris is saying you can switch to thick copper wire. Plumbing for ground has not been code for at least 30 years. It works great, though. No, I totally get it. Yeah. Like... <laughs> If you've got an older house and you have a copper supply line, then that's why they would just tie the, the ground from the panel right to the copper line because it's already grounded. It's going outside and through the dirt, right? Uh, there we go. I get it. Um, have I ever worked with any design software? Mm. Uh, yeah, and I hated it. That's why I always paid for designers. <laughs> I just, I like to work out of the back of my head. I can actually see what I want to do. I understand what I've had to do in the past. And I just go and build things, right? We just finished another shed build. Um, had a conversation with the homeowners and found out what they wanted the thing to do for them. And then I just designed it in my head and built it. So I don't use a lot of design software. Um, I find it takes almost as long to design as it does to just build the damn thing. So I just go and do it. What's the best way to transition from cement board to drywalls, walls, ceiling and shower? Okay, the best way to transition is to have the joint from the cement board to the drywall one inch from the edge of the tile. Okay, and you always want to take your tile outside of your wet area. So that way the joint is behind the tile. And so you don't have to fuss around doing it too much extreme taping. All right, let the tile be the tape. 
and just add the thin set and stick it in and you'll be fine. Okay, so Carol's question. So my house is built in 1950. The wall itself is leaking water. Okay, we took the plaster walls out. When it rains, it comes through the brick itself. Yeah, and that's not uncommon, Carol, especially in older houses. Um, you might have mortar joints that have got cracks and the water comes through, or the wind will drive it up through the soffit and then it'll come down the wall. <sighs> so here's the thing, it's brick. There's not a whole lot you can do. What I would suggest is, um, 1950, if you want to insulate that wall with a rock wool product, all right, then you're going to find that that product is going to, um, it will get wet and then it will get dry, okay? It'll drain without losing its R value. And so that's probably the only time I think it's beneficial. As far as keeping the water from getting into the house, without seeing the condition of your brick, there are, um, there's probably tuck pointing that might need to be done. All right, you, if you wanna send me pictures of your exterior brick that's the questionable, questionable wall, I'm happy to take a better look at it. But uh, there's not a whole lot we can do to keep water from getting in behind the brick. The fact that it's coming in the house is a little disconcerting. So um, there's always the possibility of other, ways to fix that that are a lot of surgery we've had situations where we've had to take apart the exterior of the wall leave the brick alone and then reattach the brick to the to the wall as we rebuild it it's definitely possible it's a pretty time consuming process but anyway send me pictures of your brick darling and then i can have a look um okay charlie says he's got an economy question on product and services sure if prices start declining how long until that the homeowner sees the benefit New Hampshire. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm confused by the question. Charlie, here's the deal. I've been teaching this for years, but it seems to escape. There are a lot of gurus out there telling people how they can make money, right? Investing in the stock market or crypto or whatever. And they all got screwed over in the last few months because those things are markets that fluctuate widely. The one thing that doesn't fluctuate is the valuation of homes. Generally speaking, over the history of the last 100 years, the valuation of a home has outpaced inflation, always, okay? I know things are expensive, but since you only get a 75% return on your investment when you hire a contractor anyway, if you do it yourself, and, and the 25% of the cost of materials, even though they're twice as what they were, the, the home valuations have doubled, so it doesn't matter you still get 300% return on your investment. So don't wait, because what you're gonna find is people that wait lose the entire year or two years or three years or four years or however long this period lasts out of their life towards renovating. And then you're gonna have to do all that work when you're four years older. So your capacity to renovate over your history of your life, once you gain the skills and the money and then the time when it gets not feasible anymore is, is only, it's a fixed window. Let's call it 20 years. You don't want to lose four of those. That's 25% of your retirement gone, right? Like this is why we renovate so that we can afford to retire because you can make a lot of money doing it. So if it's a money issue and you think it's just too expensive, think again, losing the year is more expensive because the house valuations are holding their value. So it's worth it. And it, even if the market cools a little bit and you only double your money, well, show me anybody else out there who can teach you how to double your money in today's economy right now, right? And without robbing a bank. Anyway, <sighs> welcome, Joe, um, to the membership program. Make sure you get your questions down here. What is your opinion on water pressure booster pumps? Water pressure is bad where you live due to elevation. Um, yeah, sure. They work. But, you know, like um, the solution to, to bad water pressure in a lot of cases is to have a reserve tank. You know, like that's just what it is. I mean, if you're only getting uh, like if you're only getting what is it? Uh, certainly, if you're only getting one gallon a minute. I don't care how much pressure you put on it. It's still only one gallon a minute. It's not going to be enough. Right. So you can I mean, one gallon a minute is enough pressure to cut granite in half. Okay, so it's not necessarily a pressure concern that you, you want to get enough water volume. So you might need a reserve tank to then put under pressure. 
so that you're not running out of water when you use it. Just a thought. Chanel is installing built-in cabinets in a basement where the carpet is overslept. Okay, we'll eventually do vinyl plank. Good. Do I put cabinets on top of carpet and then cut around or do vinyl plank first and then, then cabinets? Ah, very interesting. <sighs> yeah, um, first of all, I am not a fan of putting cabinets on top of flooring in basements. I've seen too many cases where they had a water event and then the cabinets, all the custom cabinets had to be destroyed too because it was sitting on the floor and it had to be removed because it was holding water and that water would go gray and then black and then smell and then, okay. So whenever you're putting built-in cabinets in a basement, do them independently of the flooring altogether, all right? And then you want to make sure that you have a vapor barrier, even plastic is fine between the cabinets and the floor. That's all. Some sort of a, 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 a some, some sort of material that, that won't allow the moisture to transfer from the concrete into the wood. Okay. And if you put vinyl plank in that one spot and, and specific to the size of your cabinets, that'll work fine. Even if it's not the right color, because in these situations, you're always going to use a baseboard or a shoe mold or a quarter round or some sort of trim work after you put the flooring in later. So it can be a different product. They can use leftovers. So don't worry about it. You can go buy one box of really cheap vinyl, stick it onto your cabinets, and then when you're all done and you put the new flooring in, trim it out. No one's any wiser, but that vinyl ends up becoming the vapor barrier and protects your cabinets. Okay, Bradley, PEX A or PEX B? What are your thoughts? PEX B restriction problems, don't believe it. Electric. Okay, yeah, so um, <laughs> there's really two kinds of PEX on the market now. The original PEX was crap. We've got rid of all that. Those problems are old and, and, and erase them from your memory, okay? Now we have a type of PEX where we crimp on the outside or we expand to sit over top of a fitting, okay? Expansion PEX is better. It also costs a lot more to buy the tools to use, right? Those expansion tools, I think, are still three to 400 bucks. So it's, it's a big bite for a homeowner to spend three or $400 on a tool to do a plumbing job. Here's the other side. The pecs that you put the compression ring on and the, the couplings and all the you know connections go inside interior of the pipe. Everything that they service outside of a bathtub has smaller holes in the valve. And so that's the restriction of the flow of water. So faucets, um, showers, they all have smaller holes in their, in, their, in their valve. So they won't restrict there, but it is a restriction to tubs, okay? So you will get a much slower fill level on a tub. So what I would recommend there is go to a specialty store, not a box store, and ask for a three-quarter inlet tub spout. And they exist. And you can use three-quarter pecs to a tub if you're using the interior rings. And then you can buy the three-quarter crimp rings for that. And then that problem is solved. Okay? Cheers. Carol has pictures. Um... Okay, so Carol, what you got to do is you go to the homepage under community and uh, Michelle will send you a message here in a minute, I'm sure. Then we have an email for help to make sure that you can direct, you know, get into that forum, okay? And um, so Michelle's watching and listening. I'm sure she's going to put a message up, Carol. But go to the community tab. There's information there to members and you'll be able to have access to that now. And you'll be able to get in the forum and then I can take a look at that uh, after the show. Okay, Oh. Well, Oh, okay. You could do a whole session on the PPE you use in your videos. Um, yeah, yeah, like my safety squints. <laughs> uh, okay, Joshua, welcome to the membership problem. Problem, yeah. You may have a problem with membership. It's too darn wonderful. Um, make sure you ask your questions down below. And then Chris says, long-term Canadian homes are only three percent per year. This bubble isn't normal, but I agree. Once you hit sixty, it's over. If you wait three and a half years, it is 10% of your working life, right? It's true. Yeah, if, if you're feeling physically fit, don't wait. Bottom line, guys, everything we're experiencing in the housing market is new. And so because it's new, people tend to think it's a short-term issue. I'm telling you right now, and this is money in the bank for you. We're going to have this same problem building homes for the next 15 to 20 years. Okay, it's a long term problem. Do you know why? Because our governments are broke and our immigration policy is off the chart bringing new people into the Western world. And there's nowhere for them to live. So until the baby boomers not only retire, but um, 
get planted six feet under and we have more space, we are going to have a housing crisis. And they're just retiring now, right? People are living longer. So we got a 20-year problem before we have room for everybody in our, in our Western culture. <laughs> Sorry if that offends or bothers you, but that's just the fact, right? We're only here for a certain amount of time. And so in, as long as we're housing folks, even if they're not working, we're going to have space issues. Okay. <sighs> Joshua, uh, you got a 1948 two-story Cape House in New Hampshire. The dormers and slanted ceilings upstairs really cut into the bedroom and bathroom space. Should I raise the roof to get more space? The dormers and slanted ceilings. The slanted ceilings and dormers. 1948. Okay, that's a very complicated stick frame construction you've got there. All right. If you want to change that, you're going to need an architect and you're going to need to buy new trusses. You can't, in most cases, just go modifying that. I know I've seen pictures where we've got an A-frame house and they'll cut the roof line and they'll just lift it up and put some sticks on it and frame it in and then call it, you know, like a huge raised roof. But um, since you've got dormers and you're going to have an issue. You're going to send me pictures, Josh. I'm really dying to see your house now. Love a good 1948 Cape Cod house. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, if you've done any work to expose the, the, the wood, like, I mean, if you're thinking about doing it for real, then then what you could do is you could rebuild a lot of your, your, your dormers, right? And you can expand your dormer system to get more headroom. So instead of like a doghouse dormer, you could do the whole side wall as a dormer. But man, you really want to plan that out and hit that when the weather is right. Because that can that could be a timely process depending on how much help you have. Yeah, it would turn it into more of a colonial. It's definitely cheaper. Okay, so listen, I'm not familiar with your skill set and what you're comfortable with. Um, but you could definitely do one side of the, the roof line at a time or even take the house into quarters, right? Um, you know, it's, it, would be, it would be a good two or three weeks of full-time attention to, to each side of the house, right? So just make sure that you've got the time to set aside to start something like that and have it closed up before the, the, um, uh, the potential rainy season, late summer, early fall kicks in, right? Okay, um, Julian thinks Jeff is amazing. I had to say that out loud. Julian's so incorrect. Tanya has a Maryland house facing north. You have five and you know, seven foot high section under your entry door to front porch step that's totally wood rot. How can I fix this myself? Okay. So basically a six by seven foot section under the entry door to your front porch. It's totally wood rot. Yeah, Tanya, you got to join the membership program. I'm going to need to see pictures. I'm sorry, I can only do so much with that picture. You're asking me a question about wood rot. I understand it faces north, so it doesn't dry. So you're going to want to change your wood to a different material. You definitely want to go to masonry. But that a lot of that has to do with the fact that you're facing north. And so you just don't get any sunshine. Anything can be done. When it comes to fixing things yourself, anything can be fixed yourself. It comes down to time and energy, really. And, and then the, fun, the finances. And making sure that you got a process that's going to be safe, right? Like when you're going to be digging out underneath your front porch, you got to know what you're doing. So I want to see some pictures. Tanya, join the membership program. Send me pictures, okay? And then I will help you out. Uh, finding contractors is a nightmare. No, it's not a nightmare. You're, the problem is you're looking. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, yeah. No, don't give me his number. You're right. Because a retired guy in his 70s is going to do a good job. Um, contractors, I have a video coming out on Wednesday next week. You're going to want to watch. Okay. Uh, we, we talk about why you can't find a contractor. And there are multiple reasons. And it's going to be eye-opening. 
And I think what you need to understand about contractors right now is they are taking advantage of the environment and the market as well. Like, listen, today I went and I took a look. I got, I'm up to date with the questions, right? I'm going to, I digress. Today I was uh, on Realtor.ca. I was looking at a bunch of houses that are for sale. Do you know how many houses out there are like 1960, 1970, 1980? And they all have exactly the same vinyl flooring and exactly the same paint and exactly the same counters and the same light fixtures. Okay. Like it's disgusting. These houses were not even eligible for a remodel. But because the market wants to move into a house that looks new, they lipstick the pig and put it back on the market and they're quadrupling their investment. They're not working for you right now. <laughs> because if you ask them to come and uh, remodel the kitchen and bathroom, you're going to want them to do it the way you want it done. And they got to work in your home with your client and your schedule and all of that that goes with it. They can just buy a house and flip the damn thing and pay the extra taxes, they don't care. Because they can make four times as much money working for themselves as they can working for you right now. And that's just the bottom line. Yeah, Josh, we have a forum, okay? Go to the community um, tab on our homepage and there's information there on how to get in the forum and there'll be a code and then you can just upload pictures, all right? Cheers. Joe wants to know, he's got suggestion for soundproofing a seven foot long bathroom wall with the bedroom on one side, okay? One stud bay is plumbing and one has electrical, small bath, like to avoid double fibrous drywall, bedroom already finished. Uh, okay, so obviously the ba the bedrooms, the, the bathroom is the wall that's open, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, if you're looking for a solution to that, then what you want to do is use fiberglass pink in your bathroom wall and then drywall with fire rated drywall. And if you're doing one of these, like uh, there's just a little bit opened up like the back of a tub or something, you can go to a commercial drywall supplier and buy half inch fire rated and it has the fiberglass in the drywall. All right. And you'll get almost the same sound rating as the five eighths drywall. So if you add the fiberglass and then use that, Trust me, you're gonna have a nice quiet wall. Cheers. Justin, bought a foreclosure with flooding issues. After a company offered a lifetime guarantee on an interior French drain with sumps. Yeah, that works. Basement has been dry, but over time the main level has become bouncy. Huh. My toddler can shake a room. There are cracked four by four supports in the basement and slightly bowed exterior walls Advice on where to go from here. If your walls are bowed in, uh, Justin, do a Google search. I'm not sure where you live. Do a Google search. There's new technology that attaches to the floor joist and bolts to the concrete floor. And it reinforces a, uh, it doesn't say here, right? Yeah, most of the time, these bowing situations happen. You have like a cinder block wall, okay? That's, and, and block walls are the problem. If you've got that much water problem and that much water around your house that you need an interior French drain, you still have a lot of water moving around the house on the outside. And so you can build up a lot of pressure around your walls. You really need to take a look at um, maybe putting in the exterior French drain as well to move the water away from your walls, right? And that's just a matter of um, a geotextile cloth a couple of feet away from the building um, and then weeping tile around the house that takes the water somewhere. But what you need is a uh, structural engineer, okay? Call them up to do a site visit for a few hundred bucks. And then they can make recommendations on how you can fix all your problems. We have the technology to make a house into a submarine if you need to, all right? So that's the answer to your question. Structural engineer and get them. And, and you will be, that's the best investment any homeowner can make who's got a major problem, okay? Don't ask contractors. They will They will say my, my whatever they're selling is their solution. They're snake oil salesmen when they kind of deal with stuff like this. So get a get a structural engineer who has no skin in the game. He's getting paid for his advice. He's getting paid for his engineer stamp. And he can give you not just advice, but the, the designs and the plans to go forward as well. Okay. And then you can decide if you want to do it as a DIY or hire it out. But at least if you hire it out from a structural engineer's perspective, you know exactly what you're paying for. And then the contractor is going to have to deliver exactly what he says and he's going to have to um, satisfy the, the construction system that the engineer lays out, 
All right. And so you got a little bit of protection there. All right. Jason, he's nothing like a sexy pig. Talking about those old houses with the lipstick on it. Yeah. Well, hey. Uh, and Luke, welcome to Money in the Bank. Cheers, buddy. Uh, and welcome to Tanya, a member as well. Wow. Lots of people joining member today. This is amazing. Lots of questions. Um, Luke says he's he's got an unfinished walkout basement. Okay. Got cracks in the foundation wall. Should I call a foundation company or get structural engineering? Can I seal crack myself? <laughs> it's a great question. Here's the answer. Um, yes, no, no, no. Yes, 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 and no. Just joking. Do. Um, foundation cracks. There's a difference between a crack and a shift. Okay. So if you got a wall that cracked, that's one thing. But if you got a crack and now it's moving in or out or up and down, okay, you've got you got a bigger issue. That's a structural engineer. Just a crack is is a totally different beast. All right. And so all cracks and foundations go all the way through the other side. And we have injection technology that they can make that crack stronger than the original concrete. So doing crack repair works. Okay. Um, so don't even concern about it. You can call a foundation company and get a crack repair technology guy out there. The technology is not yet available at box stores to do it yourself. They have something similar, but it's not as good. All right. So don't be afraid to throw five, six, seven hundred bucks at the problem because it works. If you have multiple cracks in your foundation wall, um, then I would consider getting a structural engineer in because that could be meaning something different. And I don't know how old your house is. So there's potential if it's new or old. Are you on a hill? There's a few issues there. OK, so you, you want to send me that question again in the forum and give me more information. I can direct you. But one thing you need to understand. Um, crack repair, foundation repair people. Uh, I don't know where you live, but where I live, they are not covered by the um, city as requiring permits to do their work. Okay. They're like painters. Anybody can paint. Anybody can get into the crack repair business. Okay. So you got to be real careful who you're contacting and who you're getting over there. Make sure that they've been established in business for a while and have some good recommendations and then go visit them on site. And talk to the current homeowners. Hey, are you guys happy with what's going on over here? All right. Because uh, they're not regulated. They're, they're just, <laughs> you know, it's it's a bit of big, big cowboy. And it's a serious piece of work, right? It's a serious piece of work to be given to somebody who doesn't even have to have a, a certificate. Just a shovel. Kind of scary. <sighs> Tanya, welcome to the membership program. Make sure you ask your questions down below. We'll get to them as soon as we can. And Luke says he also has a basement floor that heaved in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Um, if your flooring heaved, that's water. Wow. Do you have a sump pump, Luke? Did you get water as well? What happened there, bud? Just above there. Okay. Um, can you go up just a touch more, Maddie? There we go. Okay, there we are. Yeah. Uh, how to finish basement flooring that's got a heave. Dang, that. Paint. <laughs> that's that's the problem because a lot of basement floors are not made structural. It's just poured concrete on whatever's sitting there. So, uh, man, that's maddening. Um, and when you say heaved in the middle of the room, is it one inch or is it like pronounced like three or four? Right, one inch difference in the height. Okay, that's not a heave. That might just be a bad pour, right? And and if it's one inch difference in the height from the middle to the outside, that's really not that dramatic. So consider just putting in any, any kind of plank flooring and it should be able to adjust, okay? How do I feel about luxury vinyl plank? Non-peel and stick. Other oh, ones you just spread floor adhesive over the subfloor. Worried about water getting in between the planks since it's in the kitchen. Well, I, I'll, I'll go on even better. How, how do you feel about sheet vinyl flooring in your kitchen? They still make it. It still has the same durability. No gaps. It comes in a 12-foot wide roll and up to 100 feet long. And a good flooring installer can do that and, and seal the joint and you go to 24 feet wide. So... Unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of solutions out there, but they're not all 
desirable, but not long term. A uh, new new vinyl flooring is is a permanent solution, and they make it loose lay. You don't even have to use adhesive. You can just cut it and drop it, and you're done. So consider that as a solution. Uh, um, as for the luxury vinyl plank non peeling stick, if you can't afford to let water get underneath it, there is a product made by Mappe, and they made a new topical clear surface roll-on for vinyl that um, is a waterproofing sealant and it also has traction and they're using it and selling it as a product that you can use over top of vinyl in showers and custom vinyl floor in showers and that's enough to blow your mind right there but this stuff works it has incredible expansive capability so if you use that on your kitchen floor after putting down a luxury vinyl plank you now have a waterproof flooring surface so that's another solution glad I thought of that Cheers, Justin. Uh, good luck to you, buddy. If you need more information or you got issues navigating um, contractors and, and stuff, uh, feel free to touch base. All right. Yeah, look into that. Yeah. Okay. Joe's going to look at the half inch. It's good. Um, mass loaded vinyl. If you are in the United States, you can get mass loaded vinyl, but if you're in Canada, you can't. I'm not sure where you live, Joe. Okay. Uh, we do have um, sauna pan in, the, in Canada available now but it does add another three quarters of an inch to your wall thickness. So I'm not sure if that will work out for you. How, how durable was the Ikea cabinets with water? Um, they're just fine. Uh, the biggest issue with Ikea cabinets with water is that you actually do want to put in a small bead of clear silicone where all your panels meet the floor if you've cut them. Okay, so when you're working with your Ikea cabinets, if you're going to cut the panels, Cut them at the top where the counter is, not at the bottom, you're fine. But if you have cut them because of whatever issues, then make sure you put a clear bead of silicone to uh, give you a little bit extra protection there, or they will swell. All right. Well, okay. Julian, have any tips for me as I get ready to apply for my first permit? You need to remove a wall. Okay. Restructure plumbing in the laundry. Okay. So you're going to get a permit um, for... Removing a wall, restructure plumbing and laundry. The, 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 my best advice for permit, if you're removing a wall, is it interior non-load bearing or load bearing? I'll answer both. If it's a non-load bearing wall and you want to remove it, it's not a big deal. You just knock it out. Okay. And then you've just got to um, call your electrical safety authority. A lot of times building permits and electrical permits are two different offices. Uh, restructure plumbing and the laundry. Yeah. You got to bring it up to code. So you got to know the new code. And they're always changing this stuff, so it's not as easy. Make sure you got lots of venting, okay? And the first time you bring the, the permit officer out for an inspection should be when you're done your rough-in plumbing and all of your framing work is done so that they can give you um, permission to close, right? So that's what you got to be thinking about. You don't want to have the inspector come out and go, and I need to see this, this, and this, and this before I can give you permission to close. They get irritated. And then they, in a lot of cases, don't give you the same quality service that you'd like to get. So, um, yeah, that's the advice that I got. Who do we got there just above Andrew's question? I think Andrew. Ah, oh, well, he got a question right after he joined the membership program. Cheers, Andrew. Let's deal with it. Okay. I'm glad the videos have been helpful. But here's your question. 400 square foot crawl space in a basement. Will that always be an unusable space or can it be dug out? Located in Wisconsin. I'll say it this way. Um, there are so many systems that are not in place with an existing crawl space like that. The cost versus value of digging it out and underpinning and then trenching around the outside of the house to put in weeping tile and or interior French drain and waterproofing the outside in order to make the interior usable, depending on the age of your home, blah, 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 blah. I would say it's, 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 it's not a good return on your investment. Basements suck for ROI. If you were looking for an extra piece of living space, consider doing an addition on the back of those. So much easier, so much quicker, right? And you can do it up off the ground. You don't have any water concerns. All you gotta do is tie into the house. For me, 400 square feet addition, 
versus 400 square feet in a, square feet in a basement almost costs about the same. But you get five times the return on your investment on an addition than you do in a basement. All right. So if you got a piece of a backyard that you could make that work with, it, any day of the week, it's 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 money. Uh, if Andrew has a question here, if you don't have to modify my copper piping, can I swap my water softener without a permit? Maybe that could let me know since I'm in Minnesota. Yeah, sure. Um, having a water softener in a lot of cases isn't even part of a permit process. All right. So if you want to change your water conditioning system, the best thing to do is go on to the, um, the, the site in Minnesota and then just type in um, water softening doesn't need a permit. OK, or you can email the building officer and they'll answer your question for you. All right. Don't be afraid to ask your building office, officers, guys. Um, oh, look at that. Lots of love from Cindy here. Cheers, Cindy. All right. Yeah, hey, for the next, let's do a televangelist. For the next 20 minutes, I can give you eternal life if you all do exactly what Cindy just did. No, can't offer that, can we? But it wouldn't be sad. That's fun. Okay, here we go. Non-load bearing wall. Just rip it out, Julian. No worries. Okay? Means nothing to nobody, no how. And you don't need a demolition permit to remove a wall. Okay? I know they call it demolition day on the TV shows, but a demolition permit literally means to tear a structure down <laughs> and remove it. Okay. So it's got nothing to do with like taking crap out. So go ahead. Um, okay. Here we go. Cool. Chris says he, uh, one cold wall on his condo basement. Tempted to get the big box of spray foam to seal out the moisture and fill the drafty joy space. It's a quick fix, but it is it the best fix? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, those spray kits are a few hundred bucks and they're only going to do the rim joists. All right. So if you want to spray foam the rim joists for a couple hundred bucks, it's worth it, but you're going to want to use like a, a rigid, rigid foam, um, two by eight foot or four by eight foot panels on the rest of the wall. Okay. And then two by fours and then, um, insulation as well. Cause I know Chris, you're in Ottawa. So you got to go to R20 in the wall. All right. Uh, <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. Okay. Let's keep going down here. Does Cindy not have a question? No, she just said 40 bucks. Oh, yeah. well, thanks, Cindy. Yeah. Bless you too. All right. Well, here we go. Oh, we are an hour and seven minutes in and I haven't had a drink yet. Holy cow. How did that happen? That right there is good TV. Okay. Well, let's get back into it. Surely, surely to God, somebody out there has a question. And, and if not, I'm going to tell stories. Uh, what should I tell? Are there any stories I should tell, Matt? No cocktails. No, no cocktails today. I'm trying to get healthy, David. To be honest with you. All right. Like, uh, yeah. Golfing now. And I'm trying to make better life decisions. Man, oh, man. Ah. All right, Carl. We got a new member here. Welcome to Money in the Bank. Ask your questions. Let's get on with it. Carl needs our help. <laughs> oh. Hey, and while we're here, um, is anybody else having issues with the supply chain? Like, have you noticed things getting back to normal yet? I noticed the other day I was in the store and um, I saw some Schluter board finally on a shelf, which was like a miracle. That was nice to see. And then just last week, I was talking to a friend of mine who uh, manages a paint store here in town. And uh, his name is Rob. And um, he was telling me that they're still having issues in the paint world. And this is a fun story. So in contracts um, for suppliers, they have something called the force majeure clause. All right. Now, here's the deal. Basically, what that means is this. It's an act of God that everything is all screwed up right now. We're going to blame him. Um, <laughs> and and so what's going on is you order a, a, a hundred units of something, and then the company is under contract to supply you that, but they can only give you five. And so then you got to order another hundred, and then they give you another five. And it's, it's crazy. No one can get product. It's just absolutely nuts. 
All right. Okay. I was talking to spray from guy. He was saying 800 to a thousand for three inches on the whole wall. Not the cheapest, but it's tempting. Yeah. You know what? I'll tell you right now, Chris, my, uh, my church has got spray foam on the entire thing. Right. Um, I love it. I don't even have an air conditioning out there. And when it's 30 degrees outside, uh, it doesn't bother me at all. Like it's still so comfy. Like for me, it's, I mean, I love it, but it's not a DIY thing. You are, you're going to be hard to get. <laughs> you won't even get even near three inches on that whole wall for a thousand bucks going to the box store. Those canister units just are not designed for that. So if you've got a guy that you can get out there for a thousand bucks to insulate and you're going to do that, be one and done. That's cool. Um, but it is a wall. And if you're going to insulate it, you got to drywall it. And if you're going to drywall it because it's a wall, it's got to be finished with electrical. So you need to plug every 10 feet. Okay. So make sure you frame before you insulate so that you can run your electrical before you insulate. And then you got all those steps taken care of. Okay. Because uh, you can't just spray foam. You got to spray foam and then cover it because of fire safety. Remember guys, spray foam in a fire becomes so toxic. Like it's just nuts. It'll kill you in your sleep before the alarm goes off. Okay, so if you have foam, you've got to have it covered with a 20 minute fire resistant drywall taping system. Oh, every, everything great has got a bad side. Um, okay, so Scott is brainstorming before his flooring upgrade, current carpet. Yeah, what are your thoughts on heated floor? Would it be a dedicated 20 amp circuit breaker? What is best flooring over top of that? The circuit breaker, in where I live, Scott, it all depends on how much square footage of heating you're doing. You can do like a bedroom on a 15 amp, no problem with heat, heated flooring. Um, generally, it's a warming system, not a dedicated heating system. But you can definitely get floor heating system that's a 20 amp. That is a heating system, if that's what you're looking for. I love heated flooring. In the discussion. It is the sexiest way to finish any floor. Heated flooring. Get some. All right. Healthy, smelthy, right? Yeah, well, uh, I promised my wife I would outlive her. So that's what I'm trying to do. All right, uh, roofing materials, a bit delayed to Hawaii. What a surprise. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Carol is uh, says she has a hidden room under the front porch that was sealed off. What's the best way to reopen it? Don't. The hidden room underneath your front porch is called the cold cellar. It was an old school technology to store your fruits and vegetables be back when they had refrigerators that they delivered blocks of ice to every morning. Okay. These we're talking old school. Don't even bother. It's uh, leave it alone. If it ain't broke, don't touch it. They are a real pain in the butt and there's no value in trying to incorporate that in your home. They're usually like uh, nine or 10 square feet. So just leave it, Carol, close the door and forget you even have it. Resist the temptation because if you do it wrong, you're going to get mold. And it, it's it's not eaten, it's not hard to do it wrong. Yeah, um, Carl is restoring his uncle's 1907 farmhouse. Wow, sorry to hear that he passed. Uh, the house is a thousand square feet, give or take, on a pure foundation. Very center of the house is three inches below the corners. Huh? Will I be able to lift this much? Yeah, thousand square feet. So 25 by 40, probably something like that. Pardon? I just know if it's bright. I got the sun coming in. Is it really bright in here? That's good. Maybe, yeah, Matt's wanting to know if it's too, too bright in here. We could just turn that light off, Matt. We don't need that if that we got that much daylight coming in. Yeah, so a thousand square feet and you got a sunken middle. So what you want to do is you want to uh, open up your floor in the middle. And double check your, your structure. See if there's anything broken. Right? But generally speaking, um, your, your your main column is going to be going right down the middle of your house. Is that that? Does that help? I'm going to check my phone. Yeah. Okay. Generally speaking, the main column going right down the middle of the house um, is kind of splitting the load. And it's going to have its own structural support load points. So you want to find out if something's going on there. In 1907, a lot of cases, they would just go wood onto like a, a, a concrete or a stone or something like that. So the, the wood support might have been compromised just from age and rotting and, and water or whatever. So go ahead and check that out. No big deal to do that. And you don't have to crawl under the house to do it in a lot of cases, um, depending on the extent of the work that you're going to do. 
uh, find a place in the middle where you can open up some flooring and some subfloor and just have a have a physical look without getting underneath the house. Because if it is cracked and broken, I'd hate to have you crawling under there to find out. <laughs> It'd be a lousy time for an earthquake, hey? Uh, um, yeah, and yeah, you can lift it. You can lift it all day long. As long as it's the main beam, you can go five, six inches. No big deal. I'm not even going to think twice about it. I would, I would, I would haul off and, and lift that sucker in a heartbeat. 1907, everything is nailed together. All right, so everything is going to be able to move. It's going to make some noises. It's going to grunt and groan. But because it's nailed with no structural steel plate elements, it'll be fine. It'll get over itself. Uh, Tuco, he's got carpeted floor with spots that are definitely bumpy. Okay, I'm scared to open up carpet to see what the deal is since I'm not quite ready to redo the flooring yet. Any tips? Um, yeah, in, in a lot of cases, what that is is nail heads. Okay, uh, older carpet, you, you it, the under pad starts to get worn away. All right, it turns like sand. And so what you end up with is uh, uh, there's still going to be some subfloor that has deflection and then the nail heads start to pop up. So if you've got that going on, just take a, a block of two by four, all right? Set it on that and hit it with a hammer real hard. Drive the nail back in. If the, if the bump goes away, that was your problem. And if the bump doesn't go away, well, <laughs> ain't going to hurt nothing to try. <laughs> all right. Oh, there's Cindy's question. Here we go. Cindy has a DIY shirt. Just got it and love it. Uh, <laughs> that's right. We have merch. I always forget to mention it. So busy answering questions. Go buy some merch. Um, yeah. Home renovation DIY.com. All right. Uh, you just skimmed your walls and ceilings and was about to prime when you noticed inconsistencies between the seams. How do I approach this? What's an inconsistency, Cindy? Between the seams. Um, I'll tell you one thing. No matter what's going on, now that you've got it all mudded, prime it. Okay? Once you're primed, then go and deal with any of your issues that you find. Treat it like prime checking. Whether you want to fix it with caulking or with a little bit of more mud. Um, and then you can send me pictures of your inconsistencies. All right? Be happy to take a look and make a suggestion. Uh, Bradley Gibbs. Spray, blow, or bat? What's the best for heat? Live down in the south. Okay. Um, oddly enough, down in the south, it's not even the insulation so much. It's the um, it's the foil face. So do you have a radiant heat deflecting system on your house? Right? Oh, I'm losing you. There we go. Because... Without it, um, I mean, bad insulation works fine if you've got air conditioning, as long as you've got a radiant deflector, okay? I mean, uh, double-wide trailer with just fiberglass insulation, and, and it's a foil face fiberglass, is more than enough. The air conditioning unit works marvelously. So don't even consider about the insulation. It's about whether or not you've got the deflector. If you don't, then you've got to worry about how many BTUs you've got working with your, your air conditioning system. Okay, Corey Leach, I am an insulator on the company. People are putting in spray foam. I recommend that they put conduit in for their electrical first. Yeah, conduit's a great suggestion, or at least do all of the rough in electrical, right? And then tape the boxes so that when the spray foam guys come, they can just come in and do their job. Uh, our value is our value, but air tightness is key to getting to perform equally. Definitely. No doubt about that. And tunnelin. I'm wondering if I'm saying that right. Tunnelin? Tune in. Tune in. Oh, that's an I, not an L. No, no. Okay. <laughs> yes, you are correct. All right. Tune in. Welcome to the membership program. Okay. Series has another couple questions here about Schluter Dietra heated flooring in the bathroom. Can it go under shower pan? Yes, it can, but not the heating system. So you can put the Schluter underneath the shower pan, but not the heating system. Um, and that actually helps because it, it, it eliminates that one gap where water can sometimes get out and get in between your tile and start to rot. Can be used under tongue and groove floating. Yes. Schluter Dietra heated system does work on any floating floor system, whether it's vinyl or hardwood or laminate. Yes. No problem there. Cheers. 
Do you have to pull a permit to lift and repair piers? Um, this is Carl, 1907 house. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything where you're modifying the structure requires a permit. Also wouldn't kill to have your structural engineer come out and have a look. All right. Permit for that is really simple though, because if you have a structural engineer that's involved in your repair of your foundation work, then what happens is you go to the city and say, Hey, I'm getting my, my foundation repair and I'm using this structural engineer. And they just want to have an idea of the details and the structural engineer was going to give you a report. And so that's your details. And then the city will say, okay, great. They may want to inspect just out of curiosity, but in most cases, your structural engineer can come back and stamp your permit as being completed according to his specifications. And then the city is out of the conversation. So definitely worth it to have that. All right. Because remember city, city employees that are working in the building department are not engineers. So they don't have a clue about making a modification to building. So if you open up a permit for fixing the building, they're going to say, well, go get a structural engineer. We need, we need something to follow. And all they're going to do is make sure that what the engineer told you to do was done. Or the engineer can come back on site and he can stamp it and say, yes, it was done right. All right. So it's, it's not, it's not a scary situation at all. Um, when you're dealing with major th things like that, you know, just follow the rules, get the best advice you can. Structural engineers always return an investment. Okay. They're always, they're always money in the bank. So don't even think about it. All right. Tune in. Must know. I'm about to close on my first house. I found out during the town inspection required, blah, blah, blah. Basement, pool house, and pool isn't permitted. Any suggestions? The basement, the pool house, and the pool isn't permitted. Any suggestions? You're about to close. I don't know where you live. And it's so hard to make that suggestion. Is the town requiring you to do anything about it? A lot of times these things are just grandfathered in. Okay? If they're telling you that you've got to get it permitted, then it might be, okay, you're down in New York, Long Island. I would say, tune in. Oh, uh, yeah. Listen, I mean, the cat's out of the bag now, right? Now the city knows. Matthew's laughing. He's like, I've never heard that expression before. Yeah. Well, now, now <laughs> it's old, old, old story with crazy cats. You put them in a bag, you time the muffler. But the cat's out of the bag now, and it's mad as hell. So, yeah. <laughs> so here's the deal. Now that the city's in on it, you really got to wait and find out, are they going to require anything from you? Okay. Um, they, they are now aware that the pool isn't permitted, so they might at least want to do an inspection, make sure it's safe. So a lot of times nowadays we need, yeah, got it. We need fencing around pools. Can I have a mouse? Yeah. You're going to take off for a break? So you might want to make sure that at least, if it isn't permitted, that it was built to code, right? Sweet. Thank you. And so that's another question. Wow. Okay. Uh, let me get back to my speed here. Okay. Um, Joe says a local municipality requires a permit for an awning built to cover an existing patio. Okay. Can I avoid the permit if the awning was built as a standalone on legs and not attached to the house? Ha ha. Yeah. Most, most definitely. Anything attached to the home has to be permitted. If you're building it like a temporary pergola kind of a deal, and where you live, they don't care, and there's no building code for pergolas, then, then they're problem solved. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. You're welcome, Cindy. Um, great stuff, foam gun cleaner. Any suggestions for an alternative? Can't get any cleaner from the box stores. Oh, right? What a maddening pile of... Yeah, gasoline or WD-40. Try both of those. Um, Corey, horrible tear tightness, 2 by 4 extreme walls. Okay. Nah, Paul says he's got a 1960s house. And the concrete in the basement was not cured properly. Previous owner stated that they left the water on for too long when it was poured. Okay. That's not a question. That's a statement. I don't know what to say. 
Um, it's built in 1960. So it's there for over 80 years. So I don't know if that's a problem. Get back to me with more information, Paul, if you got a question there. Carol says her house isn't installed properly. Is aerogel good? That's quite a statement. I don't know if your house isn't installed properly, and I'm not familiar with aerogel. Um, Carol, send me a special uh, question in the forum for that, and I can research that product, and I can find out. Because a lot of times, it, it's products have different names in different regions. And so I might understand that product something different. Or if I don't know anything about it, then I'd love to research it and learn something about it, and then we can chat. Um, Paul, here we go. Whoa. Paul says, I don't have any leaks, but the floor is very chalky, and I want to seal it and then cover with flooring. Any products you would recommend? Okay. So 1960 house, the reason it's chalky, it's got nothing to do with nothing. It's got to do with the fact that you've got effervescence. It's just old. It never had a vapor barrier. All you've got to do is sweep your floor, Paul, put down a vapor barrier, and then install whatever flooring you want. And that, I mean like a sheet of plastic. Or put down vinyl flooring that has a cork backing. That'll work too. All right? So um, vinyl with cork or plastic, like a, a two-in-one underlayment with, with um, laminate flooring works. Um, definitely 1960s, I recommend using subfloor systems. Right, you put a thermal barrier, a thermal break in there as well to help make the room more comfortable. We have a basement video that I did recently. Just go check back the history of the videos a few weeks back. Check that out. You, you'll appreciate that. Okay, Walter, Jeff, you said back in February you were going to do a video on a five-piece bathroom surround. Still waiting. Are you going to do one or no here in New Jersey? Yeah, Walter, I'm actually filming that. It's and not a five-piece. It's a three-piece. It's the same process. And we were going to do a uh, mock-up of a bathroom, but instead we're adding a shower to the two piece at the church. And we're filming that, I think next week or so. It's gonna be a couple months before it gets out because we've got a lot of content in the queue already, but it is on the way. Uh, yeah, structural engineer tips, man. They are worth their weight in gold. If they charge three times what they do, they'd still be worth it. Um, Joshua says we've got natural gas line on a road and have the option to extend to our house next year. We currently have hot water radiators with an oil furnace for both heat and hot water. Is it worth converting? Okay. Um, Joshua, yes. Anything oil is worth converting. It's so old, you're, you're ready for a new system, okay? Having natural gas at your house means barbecue, means outdoor fire pits. It means on-demand hot water heating, okay? That you can use for your radiator heating system. Yep. I would convert in a heartbeat because that kind of conversion increases the valuation of your home. And since you have access to it, it means you're somewhat in city limits. So you're going to get a return on that investment. So don't even think twice. Just take it and go. Joseph, welcome to the membership. Welcome, my butt. He's been here for 24 months. Holy cow. What a, what a trooper. And he's in Pennsylvania. He has metal vent pipe in the front yard with a mushroom looking cap. Okay. Pipe is jagged and cap doesn't stay on. Fix for this. And this is in the front yard. Dude, you got to send me a picture. I am intrigued. Not too often. There's a mushroom looking cap for a vent pipe in the front yard. I got to see it. And, and, and when you send me the picture, tell me what you think it's what it's doing too. Um, yeah, wow. Fascinating. Corey, uh, okay, okay. welcome to Money Bank. Oh, Nicholas, welcome to the Money Bank. Boom, boom. Ask your questions down below, Nicholas. I'd love to help you out. Uh, for the foam cleaner, they can buy acetone. I was wondering about that, Corey. Thanks for clearing that up. Um, okay, it's acetone. Yeah, that'll work. Now, listen, there's two ways to get acetone. Uh, they either sell it on the shelf in a little steel can in the paint department. Or you can borrow your wife's nail polish remover if it's 100% acetone. <laughs> no need to go and buy something new. Cheers, Carol. Uh, how do you find a good structural engineer in your area? They're all good. They're all engineers. They all had to go to school to become an engineer. All right? Um, you don't worry about how great of an engineer they are. Just find one that's geographically close so that when they do the site visit, they're not charging you for all the kinds of travel time. That's really the secret. 
Hey, Sandy made it to the chat. Hi, Sandy. Cheers, darling. All right. Um, a triacetone. Boom, boom, boom. Joseph, Oh, and Chocolate RX made it into the meeting here as well. This is awesome. 3.30. We've got half an hour, guys. And I am up to date with my questions. Woohoo! There we go. Well, how is everybody? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's amazing. That was quite a round. All right. Yeah, natural gas means you can go Generac. Well, say, say that. Oh, oh wow. Chuck has been here the whole time lurking. That's fun. All right. Nicholas has a 1941 Cape Cod in Ohio. Just had his basement waterproofed, irrigated around the perimeter to a sump. Good. Best vapor barrier to use. Slope floor to the drain. Should I level it? I worry about water in the future. Okay. Old houses have a drain. So you want to make sure you maintain that drain. Okay. In good, good condition. So whatever you do, if you have a slip that goes to it, just work with it. It's a basement in a 1940s house. You're not going to turn it into um, like, like a luxury living room uh, on the hillside in California. It's just a basement, dude. Uh, your best plan is to find some vinyl flooring and go either right on the concrete or add a subfloor if you really feel like you need to. Uh, in 1940s houses for basements, I try to go with the concept of the less money I spend, the better to make it livable. And then if you get a water event, you throw it all in the garbage and you're going to replace it all. And it's only going to cost you five or 600 bucks. That's, that's kind of like how I like to go. <sighs> Robert wants me to tell a story. Oh my God. Who wants to hear a water story? All right, here's a story. I was renting a house years back and I just started a painting company and the um, apartment building behind us, <clears throat> thanks, Maddie. The apartment building behind us, uh, the plumbing turned out that it was going through our backyard. But for weeks, we didn't know what was going on. We had water coming up through the, the, the foundation. Uh, the floor was heaving and cracking, and there was water coming in. And there was so much pressure underneath the slab, we couldn't figure out why. And so one day, I just thought I had a floor drain as well. It was an older house. I said, well, this is ridiculous. we got to get rid of the pressure. So I went down there, took a pickaxe to the concrete next to the drain and opened up a chunk of concrete and this little fountain occurred and all the water was started to drain. And he's like, yay, because the, the buckling was nuts. And I'm just renting, right? I'm fine, I'll repair a floor, I don't care. But And then we started seeing all of these uh, chunks of carrots and corn. And we realized, oh my God, this is sewage. You know what I'm talking about? Carrots and corn, you know, that frozen stuff, that doesn't digest. It just keeps on traveling. And so it was in the sewage, and that, it was sewage under our house. And we're like, this is ridiculous. So we called the city, and for a couple of weeks, they were doing dye drop testing around the neighborhood, and they could not figure it out for the life of them. And then finally, somebody started excavating around the property. They found that the sewer for the apartment building behind us came through our backyard and had a manhole cover that was covered up that wasn't in the plans. So nobody had maintained that for like last 60 years. Darn thing cracked. And so all the sewage from that apartment building, every morning and every night, it was the same bloody thing. Carrots and corn and cigarettes. Unbelievable. And so, yeah, um, that was my first experience with a rat. Because we took the lid off to let the water flow down because of all the chunks. And then all well, the rats came in. And so <laughs> it wasn't Nate. Was he three or four or something? Was it you that found the rat? I don't remember, but one of them was downstairs and they saw this thing crawl right out of the pipe, freaked out. I had to go and kill the damn thing. And then that was definitely you. You remember that now? Okay. Yeah, that was nuts. And, and while I'm at it, I got one more rat story. I was working on a renovating a basement bathroom and it was uh, an area over in the Rockland area, which is near the river. And I never really had any experience working downtown near a river before. And so I'm doing my thing. I got the toilet off. I'm just fussing away. All of a sudden, Rat stuck his head out of the freaking toilet hole. And I'm just like, ah! And I just like freaked out. I grabbed a pail and shoved it on there. I'm like, this is nuts. So that, yeah. So moral of the story, if you um, if you leave your pipe unattended <laughs> without a cover, um, the rats are going to follow the air. So when you have a toilet, you have a pee trap. There's no air flowing. As soon as you take that toilet off, and they're like, hey, what's going on up there? They want to check it out. Quizzes, little buggers. Anyway, there's my story.
So cheers to that. Let's pick this up. <sighs> oh, David's thinking that test the power wall is the way to go. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Or here's another plan. Um, put in a few skylights, and when the sun shines, you can see things, and when it doesn't, you go to bed. You know? <laughs> I'm not a really big fan of, of all this new um, uh, electrical engineering technology because if we adopt it all, we don't have the capacity to manufacture the product. And I'm concerned that we're going to get way too dependent on things that we don't have the supply chain for. Just being honest. Um, we've had enough problems with uh, some of the Tesla products over the years for supply chain, just because uh, international trade issues, right? So the more of that, the worse. Yeah, Matt is here, Sandy. So Sandy says hi. All right. How do you identify areas in your backyard where water is designed to drain away to avoid blocking it when building a retaining wall or laying stamped concrete? Uh, just use a level. Right? As long as it's sloping away from the house, that's what the direction water is heading. And if you're going to put in a wall, then you got to put in clear stone and weeping tile so that the, the water that builds up behind the wall has a way to get out. Especially you, Angel, because you're in Toronto, from what I remember from today. Um, and you're still going to get one every, every few years where you're going to get a good decent freeze. You're going to want to make sure that your ground is nice and dry. Yeah, that was gross, Robert. Sorry, but it's just true. Uh, any uh, tune in affirmations? Wants to know if there's any suggestions for handling an asbestos floor in a basement. A few tiles seem broken. Ceiling already low. Not sure covering is a good idea. Okay, so covering it is your only idea. Asbestos floor tile needs to be encapsulated. It's a technical term for painted or a floor put on top, okay? Or floor leveler, anything. Or put in carpet with an underpad, but that's what you gotta do. When it breaks, the fibers are released in the air and they're dangerous. That particular type of floor has a fish hook fiber. And once it's in your lung, it's never coming out. You can only expose yourself to so much of that crap in your lifetime before it'll, it'll start taking days off you. So be real careful. <clears throat> Joe has a 1950s house, has an abandoned water well pump in the basement, probably last used over 30 years ago. How to remove the tank and components, just cut out, remove, and done. Hey, if it ain't being used, uh, you know, it's just debris. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. If it's a water well pump in the basement, that means that it has a, a, a supply line going to a well. If you want to get rid of it, you can. You can just cut that and you can cap the line and put a ring cramp on, a clamp ring, ring, ring clamp. My tongue's not working. And you can um, you can just do that so that you don't have any leakage going on. But yeah, I would I would just get rid of it if you're not using it. Anything that goes rusty, just throw it out. Everybody says even an architect can save thousands. My boyfriend hired one for two stories. The condition estimate went from twenty four to fifteen. For only 250 bucks. He listened to me because I listened to you. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> Gentlemen, listen to your wives. They listen to me. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, you know what? Um, if you're going to get an estimate for a renovation from a contractor and he's going to design build it for you, yep, you're damn right he's going to charge you the most expensive way to do everything. That's awesome. That's their job. Okay. Um, <laughs> what was gross is that toilet seat I removed in that short. Yeah, that was gross. That was nasty. Let's not go back there again. I don't want to gag. So wallboard again. Okay. Is there a maximum number of times you can remove and re-screw a sheet of wallboard before it's not going to be secure? Is there a world record for that? You know, as long as you've got a, a, a new surface of the drywall paper that you haven't broken through, it'll work out just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many times you've tried. Um, you know what? If you've taken it off three or four times and you're looking to screw it back on again, I maybe get a new sheet. It might be time. Carol says uh, her husband wants to, to go solar. I don't, but I can't change his mind. Yeah, no, I, that's fine. You know, I, I get it. I get the desire to uh, have a smaller footprint, but you know, if, if we've learned anything else in Ottawa in the last couple of weeks is that we don't have the most um, robust electrical system. 
we had a massive, mass, massive thunderstorm over here that lasted like 15 minutes that took out, uh, I don't know what, 20% of our power capacity. We had people from Ottawa that were like two weeks without power. Yeah, it was 50% of the population. 50% of the population. Man, that's massive. That's crazy. You know, I mean, we still got wires dangling everywhere. And we're in a four season climate. We get freezing rain and stuff. You'd think we'd learn. But the point is this, guys, like if you want to go to all electrical, then it's got to be robust, right? I'm trying, I'm trying to find an analogy. Our electrical system is like a raft, right, with a tarp as a sail, okay? It's not a very robust boat. It's complex. And we just don't have the labor to, to maintain these things. And the governments don't have the budgets to update and upgrade. So every time we get our butt kicked, we put in new parts, but... The, yeah, I know. We're going to go off-grid conversation, blah, blah, blah. I know. Listen, for 95% of people that live in a city, going off-grid is just not an option. So I don't like to talk about it because I'll leave that for the gritties. I'll let them deal with it. Right? Oh, man. Yeah, it was a wild storm. Mel, what about you? Did you have power? Did you lose it? I was in Kempville, so I didn't lose it. We lost power for like three hours. I drove around looking for gas. <laughs> which was dumb because I didn't realize what had happened. And then and we were seeing all these trees falling. I'm like, oh boy, this is really nasty. By the time we got back home, the power was on. So I was fine. Yeah, 12 hours. Okay, well, that's cool. That's that's doable at least, right? But these folks, that they didn't have power for like two weeks. That's crazy. Uh, you're a tree hugger, Sandy? Listen, I love a green planet too, but I mean, it's got to be practical. You know, I mean, if we really want to hug trees, we should just we should just say, OK, so every house built before 1980 should just be destroyed, bulldozed. But we can't do that because we can't build houses fast enough as it is already. So, I mean, you know, we're done. Half, half the world is totally inefficient when it comes to heating and air conditioning. You know, if you really want to if you really want to do something good for the environment and save on energy, we should outlaw air conditioning. Problem solved. That would do the job. We'd get an, we'd get another 20 or 30 years of expansion for free if we just got rid of air conditioning. But then we'd have a smelly society, wouldn't we? Oof. Nobody wants to do that. So, all right. Um, <clears throat> okay. I need an actual question here. Storm in Cincinnati last 20 minutes, 30,000. Yeah, it was the same storm that went through Chicago, Ohio, southern Ontario, eastern Ontario, right through New York and into Maine. And it was a 20-minute storm. And a road right on the cusp of a high and low pressure mix. It was just nasty. Oh, reminds me of what, 20, 23 years ago when we had a power outage in the grid. It was in, um, I think it was Ohio and, and Michigan and all of Southern Ontario right up to Ottawa. We all lost power for a couple of days. It was crazy. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, Corey says he's about to have a stone counter installed for a wet bar. Debating about attaching a two by four to the studs behind the wine fridge to help support the weight of the stone. Cabinet on one side only. Yes. What I would suggest is you actually install a gable panel on the other side of your fridge, Corey. Because you're going to have support on one side, support on the back where you have the two by four, and then those two corners are going to have none. And sure as sure as the sun comes up in the morning, some moron some day is going to sit on that outside corner. And then you don't have any support there. Snap, crack, a pop. You're done. All right. Um, Bradley, should I beef up my framing if it's one by four for base plate and one two by four for top plate? Uh, no, not necessary. If you already have framing that's in place and it was a one by four, that was just a different time frame, Bradley. I mean, I wouldn't even worry about it. It still does exactly the same thing. Yeah, good idea. You're right. No kidding. I, you follow the same rule for any stone countertop as you would for a kitchen counter overhang. Okay. They only go so far and they have supports every 16 inches or every 24 inches, depending. But uh, you really want to have something. Um, okay. You lost power in Ohio for two days too, eh? Yeah. The grid gets taxed enough when everyone's AC is running in the summer. wonder how it's going to support large scale electric car charging. It can't. This is part of the problem. <laughs> it just can't. Uh, we ask too much of the grid when we change policy. 
for years and years and years, everything was fossil fuels. And now all of a sudden, all has to become electronic. And it's going to be a political decision. But we don't have the infrastructure. So, yeah, good luck with that. The only time that that's going to work is when we can take enough solar to charge the car. Okay? But we're, you know, the cart's a little bit ahead of the horse here in all of these conversations because it's a great idea. But, you know, you got to think through the entire scale of, of how these problems are going to be solved. And right now we don't have a solution. If everybody in North America got an electric car tomorrow, we would have the power. Um, we'd, have, we'd, have, we'd have blackouts, like rolling blackouts all over the country. Like every day. It just would never work. <sighs> Angel has to go. He's got a project. <laughs> nice. All right, guys. We have 15 minutes left. We're going to do rapid fire questions answer. Um, Tara says, he, oh, they inherited the great-grandparents' 1915 home. And they probably were the first and only occupiers, too, right? Trying to figure out where to start. There's not much. There's no records. 1915, nobody had any records. Who to hire to get a good punch list to see what condition is everything in? Okay, 1915. Everything needs to be replaced. <laughs> There's your list. You need new water systems. You need new electrical. And you need a new heating system. Um, if you really want to figure and, and fix it up, 1915 was also plaster. So open up some of the interior walls and just change all your mechanical system. Do a real renovation. Not a lipstick on a pig remodel. Because your, 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 your home isn't going to survive. Those systems won't make it another 20 years. So don't go invest in fixtures and finishings if you don't upgrade those systems. That's my two bits. Is there a trick for using the road zip without chewing up the wallboard? Yes. You have to have it pressed up against something. Like if you're cutting around a metal box, you want to be pressing in the direction of the center of the metal box the whole time. Um, little things like that go a long way. Otherwise, two hands and, and maybe a quick prayer. Yeah, because it's tricky. It takes some experience with that, for sure. Um, you can't take my area. I, I get it. I mean, you know. But what do you think of fiberglass and epoxy, uh, like, like it's done to build boats to seal in asbestos or wood rot or mold, etc.? Okay. Where? See, where you're sealing it up is really the question, Reese. Because houses are weird. They, they need to breathe. They need to dry. So when you start sealing things on the inside, you got to ask yourself, what am I sealing and what's the goal? All right? Because you just use the word wood rot. So that means you're sealing walls and stuff. You got to be careful because if, you're, if your house is built with a system that allows water to penetrate the house, and it's an old house, and that happens then it needs to finish the drying process through the plaster into the air, okay? You start sealing things up, you're going to change change the dynamic of the home and how it operates. You can start getting mold in. Oh, there's that fancy word, Aphrodite. You got it right, the Dureco. Yeah, I've never even heard that before. You lost 70% of the trees in the county. Yeah, so do we. It's nuts. Okay. Um, gable panel for Corey. Sold. Good. What do you think of exterior rock wall insulation in a West Coast environment? Uh, works great because it can get wet and dry again. And that's the point. Because whatever you put on the house of us, a facade, you're going to get some wind-driven rain, right? So having that, that works perfectly sense. Bradley, if electric cars had alternators on each tire, could charge the car while driving? Well, you know, just let Tesla know then. That'd be great. You can solve that problem right there. <laughs> If that really worked, that'd be amazing. Um, tune in. How do costs compare gutting a basement back to the studs or refinishing to modern code for permitting the current finished basement? So you got a 1948 house, 1,500 square feet. It's currently finished, which means it is what we call grandfathered in. So whatever condition it's in is allowable. And the minute you open a wall, you've got to bring it all up to code. That's just the way it works. Um, so the cost, uh, or, or just, if you're just going to paint and change the flooring, that's your cost. But if you're going to open it up, you're going to be doing new electrical because 1948, they didn't even have copper wire. Right. So, um, and that means lights and switches and ceilings as well, because all the electrical code changed. So that's going to be an issue. All right. Um, you're probably looking at, 
1500 square foot basement. If you're doing it yourself, you're probably looking just building materials. I'm going to say in the 12 to 14,000 range to gut and rebuild. Okay. So consider that you don't necessarily have to. And if you think the wiring was done well and it's just aluminum, it doesn't make it unsafe. It just makes it not desirable by the insurance companies. Okay. Late 60s builder home in GTA, very drafty and upstairs temperature is warmer, colder, even after adding insulation in the attic. What's the best way to remedy this? Move. 1960s homes um, are not very airtight. And that's all there is to it. You're going to have drafts. And as long as you've got drafts, you're not going to be comfortable. You can't fix it. You have to take off the entire facade of the building and you have to air seal the outside of the building and then put a new facade back on. Okay. And then you're probably going to save a fair amount of money on heating and cooling because without the draft, you'll feel even more comfortable at the same temperature than you did when you had a draft. And so you'll be able to lower the thermostat. Yeah, I make the road a zip look too easy. It is easy. You just got to go counterclockwise a lot of times. All right. Um, yeah, Joe appreciates that we don't follow a script. Can you imagine doing a live show for two hours with a script? Ha! I don't know any of the HGTV stars that can sit here and answer questions about how to actually build something for 10 minutes, let alone two hours. My God. Okay. Such as in the door jam, nine minutes left. Door jam. Okay. North facing entry. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't seal. Yeah. Uh. Oh, Reese. I don't know. Door jams. You paint them, right? paint them with latex paint and it still has the capacity to, to breathe. All right. Good. Thanks, Carol. I'm glad you joined. Um, and I, uh, thanks for everybody who joined the membership today. That was awesome. Glad, glad to have you part of the team. Um, David's giving us some thank yous. Make sure you watch the video tonight, guys coming out at six o'clock. Huh? It's the beginning of the church remodel series. We are going for, occupation permit okay so that somebody can buy that church for me move in and live there and renovate it themselves that is going to be a million dollar property guaranteed okay guaranteed um any one of you could buy it if you want to you can make it a million dollar property just throwing it out there i uh i've just got a different direction that we're heading with the channel i don't want to be on a three-year project I want to get out and about and see people and, and work at your houses and have some fun. All right. Um, here we go. Is there a benefit to vinyl siding versus aluminum? Is, is there a benefit? Um, yeah, it's a lot cheaper. If you have aluminum, you can paint it and keep it. But if you don't have it, then, then you can go to vinyl. Um, outside of that... <sighs> It lasts longer. The new vinyl, the, the paint technology in there, it's, it's much more UV protectant and it'll last longer. All right. Cheers. Um, need you to vote metal or wood shed or shipping container. Need storage until Rhino is done and I don't have time to build one. Get a shipping container if you can find one. They can just drop it off or call the pods people. Uh, yeah. Aluminum dents and vinyl doesn't dent. Yeah, I mean, that's that's true. That's true. Robert never even considered that. Uh, okay, everything good. Got it. Boom, boom, boom. Uh -huh. Need to know how to post. Okay, Eileen, just go to the homepage. All right, and look under the community tab. There's information there with a link to our forum. Okay, and then that'll help you out. And if you need help, um, there's also information on there's an email. My wife Michelle will be happy to help you direct you through the steps if you need it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Oh, thanks, Cindy. Appreciate it. And you're from Hawaii. Okay. Well, aloha to all of the Hawaiian folks. We had two people from Hawaii today. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. Trust Jeff and smack the back of my head. <laughs> Melanie just finished a complete bathroom renovation. Thanks to our videos. So helpful and extremely grateful. Cheers, Mel. Way to go. Right? Listen, I'm going to finish off today with this. Oh, oh, one thing Joe says, Gable Vent, fans worth it. 
It's a narrow attic, smaller height than a crawl space, fiberglass bats, and a layer of really low blown on top. Still gets hot in the living space on the second floor. If it's still getting hot in the living space on the second floor, then yes, it might be worth it. The other solution is to get some blackout blinds for the windows on the south facing side. All right. Or consider putting in a whole house exhaust fan if you have that kind of an issue going on. Uh, I'm not sure where you live, Joe, so that might be a consideration. Uh, if you have a major project that you're thinking about doing, just do it yourself. You can't do it right today unless you are in the top three to five percent of income earners. You just can't do it right. There is nobody out there who's going to take your job, who knows what the heck they're doing, unless you're willing to pay top dollar in the market. And right now, the top dollar market is this. You get a 75% return investment when you do a renovation. The value of houses have almost doubled in the last few years. So whatever used to be a $50,000 reno is now $100,000 reno. Okay? So consider that. That also means what used to be 50,000 bucks two years ago is gonna cost you 15 to $25,000 just for material, but it's worth 75. Do it yourself, make a ton of money, right? Don't worry about the economy and the market and all the, it's gonna be very stagnant. The next 20 years, we're gonna see the same thing for the next 20 years. This is the new normal, okay? It's the baby boomers' fault. They're just too darn many babies at that time in, in history. <laughs> so now they're getting out of the economy and they're not working anymore. They're still taking up space. They've still got houses. So we're not going to have enough room for everybody for a long time. And as long as governments are broke and we're bringing in millions of people every year to help solve the labor crisis that we're under, this is what we got. Your house is worth a ton of money. So invest in it. Invest in yourself. Okay. And you are going to reap the reward of being able to sell that house for top dollar in five or 10 years from now. And then you can retire too in a lap of luxury because that's what we're doing here. I'm teaching you a system where you can make three to four times your money every single year and every dollar you put into it. And then once you're done the renovation, your house just keeps on going up in value. Just the way it's going to be. All right. That's awesome. I think I'm done. Yes, yeah, 357. We'll stop three minutes early. Guys, thanks a lot for joining. Thanks to all the new members. Thanks to all of the members who are here and supporting us for all this time. Um, we just love you. And we think you're all awesome. And you uh, you guys make my day. I'm happy to help. All right. So cheers to all of you. And make sure you watch that video tonight and support us. Um, like it, thumbs up, share, comment, all that kind of wonderful stuff. Help the algorithm out. All right. Help the YouTube algorithm decide that it should share that video with the rest of the world. Because... There's a lot of information in that video series that's coming up that's going to help make a lot of remodeling projects very affordable for folks who are struggling with the cost of materials. All right. We'd like to get that message out and help them out. All right. Cheers to next time. We'll see you in another few weeks. Bye-bye.